The top business stories live from the Sky News City studio. Inflation falls to 3.2%, its lowest level in nearly three years, but it's a smaller drop than expected. We'll have all the market reaction and assess whether it's thrown the timing of a possible Bank of England interest rate cut into doubt. Plus shares of the online fashion retailer ASOS rise by more than 5% as it predicts profit margins will return to pre-pandemic levels this year. Good morning, this is Business Live with me, Ian King. The headline rate of inflation fell again in March, but more slowly than expected. The Office for National Statistics said the Consumer Prices Index fell from 3.4% in February to 3.2% in March. That took the headline rate of inflation to its lowest level since September 2021. However, the market had been looking for a bigger decline to 3.1%. The ONS said food accounted for the largest downward contribution to the monthly change, while the largest upward contribution came from motor fuels, where prices rose this year but had been falling in March last year. Well, the core rate of inflation, which strips out volatile elements such as energy, food, alcohol and tobacco, also fell by less than expected. The rate declined from 4.5% to 4.2% ahead of market expectations of 4.1%. Well, joining me now is Kathleen Brooks. She's Research Director at XTB. Kathleen, very good morning to you. Bit of a disappointment, these numbers? A little bit, yeah. I think we've been used to a big disinflation trend here in the UK, and now it looks like it's stalling, but it was totally to be expected. We've seen large increases in the oil price. That's up more than 16 percent so far this year and this is exactly what's been happening in the US and actually what happens there usually makes its way over the Atlantic and, and impacts us here so, so it's a global phenomenon there is inflation in the pipeline but for now the disinflation trend in the UK is still intact inflation is a lot lower than it was this time last year but it's a bit of a two-speed inflation with service prices still very very high but actually some negative prices compared to last year for goods price inflation Yes, yeah, so I wonder to what extent uh, whether services inflation was actually uh, the, affected by the early timing of Easter, because, I mean, the ONS does note that hotel and restaurants saw particularly marked inflation in the month. Yeah, absolutely. They, the, the timing of big events like that, that does absolutely play a part. But then you would have also thought that that would have pushed up food prices, and that's not been the case at all. So it is, we, st we still have a lot of demand. We want to go out, we don't want to buy stuff. That's why prices of goods are falling. We want to do things. We still want experiences. We still want to eat out. Wage growth, real wage growth, when adjusted for inflation, is actually rising, even though wages are moderating a bit because inflation is falling. So we've got more money in our pockets to spend on going to restaurants, on maybe hotel stays. And that's also, we, we are generating inflation in this country domestically. And that's still being felt, Easter or not, I think. Indeed, and that is something very much on the minds of the MPC. Now, what about uh, the, uh, the fact that we are going to get another drop this month? Because obviously the energy price cap fell at the start of the month. Yeah, absolutely. So that's been well signalled that we are going to, we are expected to see a large decrease, potentially below 2% target rate for inflation for April. But it's really what happens after that. And while energy prices and our strange pricing dynamics of energy bills have play a massive part in our inflation rate, the MPC, the people that sell our interest rates, they're going to be really looking past that and seeing, well, what are commodity, global commodity prices doing? What are other uh, wage price trends, for example? So I think they'll look past the April data, but I think without a doubt, we are seeing definitely that disinflation trend. It's still there, but it is stalling a little bit. So what does all this mean for the Monetary Policy Committee? I mean, uh, it, it feels as if uh, an interest rate cut this side of uh, the middle of the year is now off the table. Definitely. It's been kicked down the can, that's for sure. So immediately after this inflation figures this morning, we did see a repricing of interest rate uh, cuts with a first cut now not expected until September. So the market's fully pricing in one cut and, and, and then a good chance of a second cut. But I think if we continue to see inflation, certainly monthly price inflation rise over the next few months, and I think that really does make a second cut this year less likely. So higher for longer, for sure. There might be a symbolic cut at some point in the second half of 2024. But I think we've really now got to look for 2025 for the bulk of cuts to come in and not this year at all. Yeah, I mean, I guess all this reinforces, Kathleen, how sticky inflation can be. I mean, don't forget in March, inflation in the US actually was up. 
Yeah, absolutely. So we, uh, yeah, the, the UK for once is doing better than the US. But um, yeah, this is a global phenomenon. Inflation is incredibly sticky. We're just not used to it because we haven't had it for so many years. Um, but this is what central bankers have always warned about. Once inflation comes out of the bottle, they've got to be really, really careful. It is incredibly sticky. And, and the, the sticky elements of inflation are very evident in the UK economy. And that's what the bank of England don't want to do. It will look so much worse for them if they cut rates and then inflation keeps rising or, you know, even gathers speed. So they're going to be really, really wary of that. And I think, you know, the next couple of meetings are going to be really interesting to see what are their forecasts, their longer term forecasts for inflation, because the longer term forecast for interest rates, they are actually drifting higher. Indeed. Kathleen, got to leave it there, I'm afraid. Good to see you this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Some other business news for you now. And the drugs giant GSK said today that Shingrix, its blockbuster shingles vaccine, remains effective years after being administered. The company published trial data suggesting that 6 to 11 years after vaccination, Shingrix had 79.7% efficacy in participants aged 50 years or more. The vaccine's efficacy was at 82% for patients who had been vaccinated 11 years earlier. Well, globally, shingles, which is caused by the same virus that causes chickenpox, will affect up to one in three people in their lifetimes. Global Council, the advisory firm launched by former Labour Minister Lord Mandelson, has reportedly been valued at £30 million. The Financial Times says that is the valuation placed on the business after the Messina Group, an advisory group set up by the former Obama campaign manager Jim Messina, acquired a 20% stake. Well, until now, Global Council has been majority owned by Lord Mandelson and his co-founder, Ben Wegg Prosser, a former communications director to the former Prime Minister Tony Blair. ASOS said today it expects to return to sales growth this year and to see profit margins back at pre-pandemic levels. The online fashion retailer was reporting a pre-tax loss of £270 million for the 26 weeks to the 3rd of March. That was down from one of £290.9 million in the same period a year ago. ASOS also named former Sainsbury's and Amazon executive Dave Murray as its new chief financial officer. The shares currently head by 5.5%. Saga claimed today it will return to making an underlying profit this year. The cruise operator and insurance provider was reporting a pre-tax loss of £129 million for the year to the end of January. That was down from a loss of £272.7 million during the previous 12 months. Mike Hazel, Saga's chief executive, said the company's ocean cruise business had enjoyed an outstanding year but admitted its insurance business had continued to be hindered by challenging conditions. The shares are currently ahead by two and three quarter percent. Now, we've talked a lot on this programme in recent months about the ability of generative AI to transform the provision of data and information in fields such as law and accounting. A recent example saw Thomson Reuters launch a generative AI assistant for the legal profession, Co-Counsel Core, which can go through thousands of documents and answers lawyers' questions on them in seconds. Well, today, the information giant announced it is rolling out the service to all of its professional customers. So joining me now to talk about this is Kriti Sharma, Chief Product Officer of Legal Tech at Thomson and Reuters. Critty, welcome to you. I assume that this uh, announcement means it's, it's gone down quite well. Absolutely. We're seeing a lot of excitement from professionals of all kinds, from legal, tax, accounting, risk and so on, really embracing trusted generative AI for professional work. And we really think um, in with the, with the pace at which this is going, in three to five years, all of us will have a professional grade legal assistant or AI assistant helping us do our work better. How much are you going to be charging for this? <laughs> it's not something we are willing to or, or um, talking about right now, but we really think the value, the outcomes that we are delivering to the customers is um, is very much in line with the investments that they are willing to make as well. How much does it uh, cost to develop? A lot. <laughs> um, what I would say is with generative AI becoming more and more um, available through various tools and products, the cost of building these technologies is starting to come down compared to where it was just even 18 months ago. So we will see a lot of that benefit passing on to our, our customers as well. What we do see more importantly is a keen demand to make sure these technologies are doing two things. First, delivering the outcomes. It's no longer about, let me get some tech to, to get the tech. It's really about, can it, can it deliver productivity and efficiency? And second is about trust. Can it do it well? Can it keep my data secure? Can it give me accurate responses? I talked in the introduction about uh, what this can do. What can't it do just now? 
Um, so technology today is at a point where it can delegate, you can delegate certain tasks to it. Um, we still recommend that for legal tasks, for example, a legal professional reviews the outputs. Um, it can give you source citations. So it can explain its work rather than a black box that you don't understand where it pulled information from. But the responsibility for making sure the trusted advice to clients is delivered, that that is absolutely with humans. And I do think this technology, more importantly than anything else, it's going to remind us what it means to be human. Are you able to monitor how customers are using the app? Um, we do not use the data to train the models. And uh, However, what we do help them do is use it better. Um, so we don't track exactly what they're, they're doing, what prompts they're injecting, because that can lead to um, using the data to train the overall model. So we don't do any of that. However, what we are learning and hearing from our customers is a lot of um, excitement about the possibility of what the technology can do and the benefits it can deliver today and some caution about how to make sure this is done right. Now, this is char uh, powered by uh, ChatGPT. Does that preclude you from using other large language models in future? Um, so, ChatGPT is a consumer-grade um, chat service yeah. that came GPT out of op OpenAI. Yeah. Um, we use a variety of models, um, not only GPT-4. Um, this space is evolving very rapidly, and there are a number of different techniques, so it doesn't tie one to any specific models. OK, Chrissy, we have to leave it there. Good to see you today. Thank right, you. Thank you. Well, the pound has traded higher this morning following the March inflation uh, figures, which obviously, as I say, failed to fall by as much as expected. Sterling currently ahead by uh, just under third of 1% against the US dollar, slightly ahead against the euro. The single currency, meanwhile, up by a fifth of 1% against the greenback. On the equity markets, well, there was mixed trade overnight in the Asia-Pacific region. The Nikkei in Tokyo fell for a third straight session to finish below 38,000 for the first time in two months. Well, in Europe, meanwhile, this is uh, how the picture is right now. Stocks doing their best to claw back some of yesterday's losses. All of the main indices in positive territory just now. A lot of corporate news around in uh, Europe today. Talking points today include the luxury goods giant LVMH. France's biggest company is up by some 4% after quarterly sales proved better than expected. Meanwhile, Adidas is up by 7 and 3 quarter percent in Frankfurt after it raised its profits forecasts overnight. Well, here in London, the FTSE 100 also in positive territory just now. Very much uh, the mining heavyweights uh, doing a lot of the heavy lifting there, if you'll forgive the pun. That's on the uh, back of higher metals prices. That's lifted even Rio Tinto up 3% just now. And that's despite the fact that its quarterly iron ore shipments, which were reported this morning, came in below X expectations. Other notable gainers in the FTSE this morning include Burberry. That's currently ahead by just over 2% on the back of the trading update from LVMH. While the betting and gaming group Entain, that's currently ahead by some one and a quarter percent. That's on the back, of course, of the Labbrook's owner posting better than expected online gaming revenues. Outside the FTSE 100, well, this time yesterday, I was telling you all about the latest profits warning from Dr Martins. The shares fell by 29% yesterday. They're off another 2% this morning. Elsewhere, well, the oil price has given back all of its uh, gains from uh, yesterday afternoon. Barrel of Brent crude currently changing hands at $89.34 a barrel. That's off three quarters of 1% on the session. Well, joining me this morning is James Ringer. He's fund manager at Schroders. James, welcome to you. I mean, I mentioned uh, Sterling's response there to uh, the inflation numbers. I didn't see much of a, a response on the gilt market. Um, certainly, if you had begun this week with uh, perfect foresight of stronger wage data and stronger CPI, you would have thought that gilt yields would be would be a lot higher. Um, but I think a lot of that, or a lot of the price action that we've seen, or the lack of price action you mentioned, is, it probably reflects the fact that you have seen a lot of interest rate cuts being taken out of the market already. Um, and so I think there's probably a, an element of a bit of, bit of relief that actually uh, in Inflation is still falling, although it is falling slightly slower than, than the BOE and the market had hoped. Um, but yeah, I think it's probably a case of um, uh, the, uh, a, a little bit of relief that actually things are still moving in the right direction. Obviously, we saw an uptick in uh, inflation in the US in, uh, in March. This is for quite the first time for a couple of years that US inflation's uh, been higher than here in the UK. I mean, it's a reminder that inflation doesn't fall in a straight line. Would, would you have concerns about inflation going forward? Obviously, we expect to get a drop in uh, April. But what about after that? Yeah, I think it's right to, to, to look at things and reference the US. Um, but I think the US is in, is in a very different spot to the UK and, and to Europe. I think we would... 
we would argue that the UK is, is much more Europe-like than it is US-like. Um, you only have to look at growth rates to, to see that. So whereas Europe and the UK are, are barely growing above zero, um, the US is growing at a very healthy clip, well above 2%. So I think inflation fears are clearly resurfacing. Um, but I think those inflation fears at the moment should really be isolated to the US. Um, like you said, we still have some fairly positive news to come on the on the UK inflation front from the base effects from the uh, energy price cap. So for now, it's something we're, we're keeping a very close eye on. But the, the lead indicators that we look at for UK inflation would suggest that that gap between the UK and the US uh, should continue, i.e. UK inflation should continue to fall, um, whereas the US, I think, is looking clearly looking a little bit more sticky. Obviously, uh, overnight, we've heard from the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey and his US counterpart, Jay Powell, both of them speaking at the IMF in Washington. I mean, I thought Powell's comments were particularly interesting in that he really does seem to be almost guiding the market away from expecting any interest rate cuts in the foreseeable future. Yeah, it's amazing, amazing what three months, um, what three months can do. I think they... They were clearly they came into this year with some, with some fairly positive views on on inflation. The inflation would be falling back towards target, and and by the middle of this year, they had, had hoped to have enough um, enough data, enough evidence that inflation was well and truly back on what they call a sustainable path to two percent. I think the last three inflation releases that you that we have seen from the U.S. clearly calls that into question, um, and now that really the Federal Reserve are just marking themselves to the market. Um, and pushing back on that June that June rate cut, they're still not closing the door to rate cuts um, in in totality. But I think the fact that they're willing to push it out, there's clearly a risk that you you certainly don't see the three rate cuts that the market was hoping for this year. Um, and actually, that could be drifting down towards two or even one. Absolutely, and obviously, it's a, an election year in as, in the US as well as it is here. I mean, how difficult does that make the, the Fed's job? I mean, Bill Dinning, one of our regular market commentators, was saying on Friday it's unusual for the Fed to cut rates in an election year. I mean, outside the pandemic and the global financial crisis, the last time it did so was 1992. Yeah, so that that statistic is certainly correct. It does it makes their job more difficult, but I, I do think that. Um, People are questioning central bank independence, and, and probably wrongly so. I think that they uh, look purely at their inflation mandates, or in the case of the Federal Reserve, they have both an inflation uh, and an employment mandate. Um, and I think if, if either of those were to suggest they need to cut interest rates, they would do so regardless of the timing of the US election. I mean, obviously, uh, Trump, when he was president last, uh, regularly took pot shots at uh, Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve. Would you have concerns as an investor about the Fed becoming a political target again in the in the forthcoming election campaign? Yeah, it's, it's something that we have to debate um, and, and discuss on the desk. I think it's, it's a tail risk at the moment. We obviously saw in Trump's previous terms um, that he, he didn't sack the, the then Federal Reserve um, chair. So I, I don't think it's, it's anyone's base case. Um, I think that they understand and he'll be surrounded by people who understand the importance of having an independent central bank that is not politically motivated. So I, I certainly don't think it's a base case, but it is something that we, we definitely have to discuss. OK, James, have to leave it there, I'm afraid. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Still to come here on Business Live, a breakthrough in kitchen pan technology, which has seen tens of thousands of people join the waiting list. Stay tuned. Um, we found an assemblage of 500 items, um, medieval, Bronze Age to medieval, which is the biggest um, assemblage of Bronze Age to medieval finds from the whole of Fife ever from one area. Um, the coins date to 1466 AD and their copper alloy. Um, they're in pristine condition and the last order of its type was found in Crossroads Abbey in 1919. So it's a really, really rare hoard. A once in a century hoard. Uh, it was found in a, in a latrine, obviously, in a, a, a toilet. Uh, it was obviously been dropped with a monk and it was the coins were found in the sediment uh, of the latrine. And um, obviously my coins were in far superior condition uh, due to the soil. So it was just amazing. Yeah, what a buzz. It was 52 of the farthings we found. Uh, but also in the general area, we found uh, two John Balliol uh, farthings, uh, the only two found uh, in the whole of Scotland. So they're extremely, extremely rare coins. We also found a uh, Malcolm farthing. I think there's only three found in the whole of Scotland. Um, so just exceptionally rare coinage. 
on the site. We, we, we don't actually know if it's a, a hybrid site, if it's a settlement stroke market site, but it's clearly clearly very significant. Yeah, the medieval ring was, was found a, a wee bit away, it was maybe a field or so, uh, but sometimes you have to wait because of the crops that are in uh, stubble when they get harvested and they're too high and you can't get your metal detector right to the ground. Yeah. So you just go right over the fines, you know, so the conditions have to be perfect. And the, the carrot harvest, uh, the conditions were perfect, you're again, to your metal detector right to the ground, which you actually need for medial material because uh, it's so thin. Uh, so you have to get your detector right to the ground for optimum conditions. We've got a 50 50 chance of getting a, the permission. Uh, it just depends, um, you know, on your, your luck at the time if somebody else is detecting the land or if the farmers actually want a metal detector that's in the land. Eh? Um, so it just depends on your luck. Travelling is not just about the destination, it's also about how you get there. Fly Emirates, fly better. Fly Emirates, fly better. Welcome back. America's prestigious University of Dartmouth this week warned of the risks of so-called forever chemical poisoning caused by toxic chemicals called PFAs that can occur in foodstuffs and even in some forms of non-stick frying pan coatings. Well, that's led to a surge in demand for a new non-stick pan made without forever chemicals. The always pan made by Our Place has been endorsed by celebrities, including David Beckham and Selena Gomez. It's sold out ten times over following its US launch and at one point had a waiting list of more than 50,000 potential customers. Well, Joining me now is Shiza Shahid, the co-founder of Our Place. Shiza, welcome to you. What made you go into this particular product category? Thanks for having me, Ian. I wanted to make better products, products that inspired me to cook, inspired me to host dinner parties. I've always believed that breaking bread with one another is how we reconnect to our communities, our cultures, our traditions, our families, our bodies, and our health. And as I would walk the kitchenware stores, I, would, I wouldn't see products that were healthy, that were clean, that were innovative. The cookware industry hasn't adapted or changed in a hundred years. And so it felt like it was time to make something better. Why is that? Why hasn't it changed? I don't think there's been a lot of competition. There's a handful of entrenched players. They've been doing things the same way. I also think that we've been taught not to see our cookware, our appliances, our kitchenware as brands or as products where we have choice. We kind of walk in, we buy the same thing, we don't ask a lot of questions. And we change that by integrating science and art and saying, these are performance objects, they're also inspiration objects. We want you to feel creative in the kitchen and give you better choices. How difficult was it to come up with something that was non-stick but didn't contain PFAs? It was very difficult. We worked on the first product for two years before we ever launched the company. We now have our proprietary coating Thermokind, which is primarily made with sand and water. Uh, the solvent in other non-stick coatings is PFAs, Forever Chemicals. They have a half-life of a thousand years. So that's staying in the environment. Um, it's impacting your health. It's impacting worker safety. And we recently came out with a new product that is the first non-stick made with zero coating. Now, uh, we've been talking a lot about inflation on the programme this morning. How, how are you grappling with that in your manufacturing? Well, we're definitely seeing costs rise. We've been able to hold off on passing those on to our consumers for now. Uh, but we're definitely having to look at our supply chain and make sure that we're continuing to invest in quality products um, and doing what we can to optimise the cost for the customer as well. 
Now, I mentioned in the introduction, you've, you've had a lot of celebrity endorsements. You're all over Instagram. Are, are you deliberately positioning this to be an aspirational product aimed at sort of high net worth customers? We, we do think of it as, as aspirational, but not aimed at high net worth customers. Well, we're based in Los Angeles, and so I think by virtue of being out there, uh, we have many celebrity investors and customers, uh, but we have customers all over the world. Um, and of all ages, of all genders, of all backgrounds, the, the way that we design the products is we make products that do more with less. So if you walk into another kitchenware store, you typically walk out with 20 pieces of cookware or 16 knives. And we realized you don't actually need all that stuff. So we make multifunctional products. You're buying less. They may be a little bit more expensive than a single pan, but you don't need to buy 16 of them. I've seen you described in some quarters as the Le Creuset for millennials. Are you benchmarking yourself against that particular company? Is that, is that a comparison you welcome? You know, Le Creuset has been around for 100 years and they make absolutely beautiful Dutch ovens. And uh, we've definitely taken some inspiration from them, but we've also done things differently. We're not using those PFAS coatings uh, that you will find on a Le Creuset nonstick pan. We're also creating different products, lightweight products, compact products. We're integrating new technology because kitchenware, uh, it's, it's innovation, it's technology. You're lighting things on fire, you're putting them in a thousand degree ovens, you're scrubbing them with metal utensils. So they're beautiful design objects which Le Creuset definitely brought to the market and we see ourselves in that bucket as well. But they're also performance and science and technology objects. So we're marrying the art and the science. OK, now, before you uh, went into business, you co-founded the Malala Fund. I, I know you haven't been involved with that for a number of years, but are you still in touch with Malala? Absolutely, and I'm so proud of her and, and everything that the organisation is doing. It's working to help girls all around the world and in some of the most vulnerable communities access education with a specific focus on secondary schooling, so really keeping girls in school through high school so they marry later, they have children later, their children are more likely to be healthy and they are more likely to earn an income. And it really is one of the most effective interventions we have in ending poverty. It really is. It's uh, changed a lot of people's lives. We've got to leave it there. She's lovely to see you this morning. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. That's it from me for the time being. I'll be back, of course, at half past four with our afternoon edition. Hope very much to see you then. In the meantime, do stay tuned. Coming up immediately after this short break, it's Prime Minister's Questions with Jane Secker and our political editor, Beth Rigby. Don't go anywhere. I'll see you later on. Thanks for joining me this morning. <laughs>